Bonsoir à tous. Je m'appelle Mélissa et je travaille pour le département de la Bibliothèque et des événements communautaires de la ville de Westmount. My name is Melissa and I work for the Library and Community Events Department of the City of Westmount. Bienvenue à cette conférence présentée dans le cadre du Jour de la Terre. Welcome to this panel discussion presented for Earth Day. Depuis 1970, le Jour de la Terre est, une, est un événement annuel mondial destiné à encourager les initiatives en lien avec la protection de l'environnement. We are thrilled to have such wonderful guests tonight. We invited three local business owners whose companies incorporate the values of sustainability, waste reduction, and reduced environmental impact. We will have the pleasure to discuss with Annie Rouleau, founder and CEO of The Unscented Company, Chris Stern, co-founder and CEO of Carbicrete, Julie poitras saulnier president of Loop Juice, The discussion will be hosted by Matt Gilmore of CTV News. Mr. Gilmore is a video journalist with a special passion for stories concerning the environment and climate change. Merci à tous d'avoir accepté notre invitation. We are really grateful to have you here tonight with us. During the event, you may send us your questions in the Q&A function located at the bottom of the screen. Au cours de la conférence, vous pourrez nous faire parvenir vos questions dans la section Q&R qui se trouve au bas de l'écran. Without further ado, I will let Matt Gilmore take the lead and start the panel. Thank you. Right. Hope you enjoy the discussion. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Melissa. And thank everybody else uh, who's watching for joining us on this uh, Earth Day. So happy Earth Day to everyone. Um, we're going to discuss today a really interesting topic. It's climate change and making a difference through business. As uh, Melissa said, my name is Matt Gilmore. I'm a reporter with CTV News. And before we get started, I just want to uh, thank the City of Westmount and also Westmount Library for putting this together and, and thinking of us to take part. Um, and I also want to say that today was actually a very interesting Earth Day because something actually happened today. There was a climate conference, a virtual climate summit hosted by the United States, um, hosted by President Joe Biden, uh, special envoy for the climate, uh, John Kerry, um, and some big uh, announcements were made. So. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about that first so that we can frame the conversation. Um, the U.S. today committed to having its uh, emissions by 2030, cutting them in half. Um, Canada also uh, updated its climate emissions targets, um, 40 to 45 percent reduction by 2030. That's more ambitious than the target that we set uh, at the climate uh, agreement uh, in 2015. And the UK also committed to cutting its emissions by 78% by 2035. We've also just seen a budget in Canada that there's a lot of spending towards a green transition. And there's a lot of talk in the US about that movie, move, that country moving in that direction as well. Um, and I think that all of that kind of dovetails nicely into the conversation that we're going to have this evening. Um, you know, with us on the call, as was said, uh, we've got three business owners. Um, who are really walking the walk when it comes to uh, climate conscious business. And so first, I just want to give each of them an opportunity to uh, sort of explain who they are, what they're about, what their companies do, um, and why they chose to um, commit their companies towards environmental sustainability um, and, uh, and tackling climate change. So first, um, uh, Julie, why don't you tell us a little bit about Loop? Super interesting company. Um, how is it that you guys, you know, where, how do you, where do you get your products and, and what does Loop stand for? Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so Loop Mission is actually a circular economy company that reduces food waste by repurposing the outcasts of the food industry. So we look at what's being thrown away in the industry and we turn it into something new. So we started really, it just started by a phone call from one of the most important produce distributor in Eastern Canada. And he called us saying that he was throwing away more than 16 tons of fruits and vegetables every single day uh, for many reasons, like just can be shelf life issues, speculations, victims, uh, or just aesthetic criteria of how the, the produce should look like. And so we decided to partner with them and we built a factory within their warehouse to transform these misfits into cold pressed juices and smoothies. Uh, and to upcycle our own waste, which is all the leftover fiber and pulp from juicing to make uh, dog treats and pizza crust. 
and uh, and then we got we, we started to have media coverage and everybody in the industry started to call us uh, saying that they were throwing away a lot of food too so we just rebranded that and we we came from loop mission to loop uh, from loop juice to loop mission and we developed all these other products with the same model we have beers made with day old bread uh, gin that upcycles uh, potato cuttings from a chips company uh, we have soaps made with recycled cooking oil from a restaurant chain, uh, fermented the probiotic sodas made with the hydrosol, which is a byproduct of the essential oil industry. So basically, we look at what's being thrown away and we, we transform trash into treasure. That's the whole model. Excellent. Thank you so much. And Chris, uh, um, you know, CTV's done stories about, uh, about Carbocrete in the past, and I found it to be very interesting what you guys are doing. Tell us a little bit about what Carbocrete is and what yeah, well, you guys are trying to solve. Thanks, Matt. Uh, well, I'm glad to be here and happy Earth Day to everybody. Uh, it's a wonderful day um, and it's uh, time to reflect on uh, where we live. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity. But uh, Carbocrete is, uh, is, is concrete that doesn't use cement. Uh, and nobody knows, like not a lot of people know this, but cement is responsible for 8% of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, like that, that's four gigatons of CO2 that are spewed out because of the manufacturing of cement. So cement is the main ingredient of concrete, which um, is the second most utilized substance in the world after water. So there's two tons of concrete made every year for every human. So think about that. There's 15 billion tons of concrete made every year. Uh, and our concrete does not use cement which is the, the greenhouse gas emitter. We use uh, an industrial waste byproduct that uh, otherwise ends up in landfills called steel slag. So when they make steel, there's 15% of it is a, um, a mineral that is generally just thrown away. So we take that, we repurpose it by um, turning it into a powder and reacting it with carbon dioxide. So we solve three different problems. Um, we get rid of uh, steel slag, which is an industrial waste. We, get, we don't use cement, which is absolutely nasty, just as nasty as making steel and uh, almost as nasty as uh, the agriculture business. Uh, and, and furthermore, we make, um, and, and we sequester CO2 quite efficiently. And the, the fourth thing actually is we make a product that people can use, concrete. And, and Annie, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the Unscented Company. What, what's your mission? You, you guys are what's called a B Corporation. Can you tell me about what that is? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, you know what? The Unscented Company, when we started uh, in 2011, I wanted to just redefine the, uh, the notion of clean because um, I, was, I wanted to start a soap company, but a soap company is part of an industry that creates probably one of the worst environmental disaster, which is the single-use plastic packaging. So right at the beginning, when I started the business, I said, listen, we're, we're going to have a good home uh, and body natural care products, uh, biodegradable, exclusively unscented, but we will design our products to reduce our plastic footprint. So the entire mission has been on making sure we are part of the movement, we're part of the solution to reduce plastic. Um, I, I've never written down my mission as becoming the leader of dish soap in the world. I'm not interested in that. It's not sexy. And, uh, and really the mission has been since day one. And in 2014, when I was introduced to the B Corp certification uh, through Yvon Chouinard of Patagonia that uh, I, I assisted to one of his lecture, um, I knew that really uh, suited my business model. So B Corp is a certification that you start by opening your status of incorporation. So profit is important. We all agree on that, but not to the detriment of the community and the environment. So you put within the profit your environmental consideration and your social consideration. You close down, close back your status of incorporation and legally you're bounded to that. 
So from uh, the environment, from the governance, from the employee, it's really a set of standards uh, that you will manage your business, grow your business. So there's a lot about a B Corp, um, but I definitely is the, it, it's the structure, it's the foundation of my business so I can grow the business. And I think that that's something that people call the triple bottom line, right? It has Absolutely. a lot to do with that. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that in a little bit, but first I just wanna sort of point out to everyone watching that all three of our, of our guests, they work sort of in an industry that they've identified as being wasteful in some way, whether it's wasted food, whether it's a lot of plastic pollution or whether it's mm -hmm. um, a lot of CO2 uh, emissions. Um, and all three have found a way to sort of build a business around fixing a problem in one of those industries. And so, you know, I just want to sort of point out that I hear a lot people saying that if you want to be a part of the solution, do one thing and do it really well. Um, and I think that that's what all three of you guys are doing. Um, and I just wonder if you could maybe go a little bit deeper into, into some of the issues that you're seeing. So Julia, I'm, I read today an astonishing <laughs> number that 30 to 40% of food in Quebec is going into the trash almost right away. That's, that's yeah, incredible. Yeah it's, quite shocking. yeah, it's shocking. When you start looking at numbers in terms of food waste, it's, it's really shocking. And, and for a long time, uh, we thought that lots of the food waste came from the consumers, but recent studies show that 78% of food waste comes from the industry. And that's super shocking because as a consumer, I was really conscious of food waste, being really careful not to throw any, in, away anything. And when you see the impact of the industry itself, it gets so frustrating as a consumer. So that's why we decided to really inspire their, the entire industry towards a new way of doing business. And it's just a way of connecting businesses together so that the leftovers from one company become the ingredients from the other ones. And, and because there is nothing as, as waste. And, and in terms of, of global warming, uh, food waste plays such a, a huge uh, role because if you look at it, 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions come only from food waste. If food waste was a country, it would rank third in terms of greenhouse gas emissions emit emitter after China and United States. So it, it's huge. And that's because um, people think that when you send uh, food to landfill, it's not that bad because it decomposes. But in a landfill, there is no oxygen, there is no, uh, there is no light, which is two elements that are necessary for the elements to decompose. So it's actually one of the worst thing you can send to the landfill uh, because it creates a lot of methane and greenhouse gas emission and lixivia that leaks into water and, and rivers and, and, and soil. So it, it has a really, really big impact on the environment. So that's why we decided to, to tackle that, uh, that problem specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, something that you mentioned there, you know, you thought it was individuals wasting, but really it's the industry. And, and I think that that uh, sort of, you know, leads nicely to this debate that I hear a lot, whether it's individuals responsibility to tackle climate change through the decisions that they make, the, the products that they buy, or is it really something that, you know, it's a much bigger issue that really the individual can't uh, solve. And, and Chris, the work that you're doing, um, you know, 8% of CO2 emissions just in cement, um, there's cement and concrete everywhere. And so where do you stand on that debate? Is it up to the individual or really is it systemic change that we need? No, it, it definitely is systemic change. And, and quite frankly, it, it's coming not from, uh, it's not coming from the cement companies, that's for sure. But like uh, the big tech companies are actually paying big dollars for companies like ours to sequester CO2. Like it's it's insane. And, and, and this all happened during the pandemic, right? Like the, before, like a year ago, nobody was talking about this. Like, and now the tech companies are, are all paying big dollars to have companies like ours sequester CO2. It's and so you guys, you, you guys will sequester the CO2 and then you use that to create a cleaner version of concrete, right? Yeah, we actually consume CO2. So we actually get rid of it. I think that the, the, the big bogey that we've all been talking about for the last 20 years, we actually put into concrete and bury it forever. And so, and, but it's not just, you know, the concrete and, and construction industry that's, um, you know, that, that needs to be fixed like this. There's lots of, like, it's the transportation industry and all these types of things. 
we hear a lot about in Canada, like we have one of the highest per capita carbon footprints in the world of any country. Yeah. Um, but how much of that is the fault of the individual and how much of that is the way that our society is set up? I think it's the way that our society is set up. I mean, like, like you know, for example, people living in, you know, off the island and, and, and driving into work like this, you don't need to do that, right? And we've all figured that out during the pandemic. You can live wherever you want and tell a commuter, right? So that's that's one part of the solution. So we don't get into cars. And then the second part of the solution is if you get into a car, get into an electric car. And if you have an electric car, maybe charge it with electricity that's made not from fossil fuels. You know, so it's, it, it does, it, it's sort of like, I, I would say it's a mix between the two, the, the two parties, but the question, the, the point of it all is that who needs to be driving it, right? There's government, there's human beings, like all of us, and there's corporations. And I think everybody's banded together now uh, as of like the last six months, and we've actually drawn a line in the sand, right? Like the, the, the Biden administration came out today with this 52 to 54% reduction of GHG. Our government came out with uh, an increase in our reductions and they both need to be increased. But the point is, is that everyone's marching to the same tune now. And, uh, and well, what I believe is, and we have to continue doing that. And, yeah. Sorry, if you've just joined the call, uh, your, yeah, thank you very much for muting. <laughs> um, you know, I think Annie, you, you uh, are someone I think who believes a lot in the buy local um, philosophy and, and that maybe is one way that somebody can contribute to um, you know basically voting with their dollars as you put it yeah. as you would put it um, talk a little bit if you wouldn't mind the idea of thinking globally but buying or acting locally uh, and what that sort of means to you and, and why it's important you know what since the beginning uh, I grew up in a family with both my parents being entrepreneurs and le contenu québécois was something we would talk about at night. So for me, I knew the business I would start uh, since the beginning, 90% uh, of my supply ship is within 500 kilometers. Uh, I'm not gonna say Westmount because the business is not in Westmount, but from Villemar. And, um, and you know what? Everyone kept telling me, oh, you know what? It's not gonna work. Uh, or you're kind of confronted with your conviction every morning because people from everywhere around the world wants to help you out and reduce your cost. But um, I stick to it. And I really, that was something that was important to me, making sure uh, we were buying locally, we were developing partnership. And as uh, Chris mentions, during the pandemic, it kind of made sense because not only did I, um, I didn't put pressure on my chain of supply, of supply ship, because I was able to call Francois in Vaudreuil and to call Sébastien in Belleuil and in St. Julie and say, okay, we've got to step up and we were able to supply. And everyone in the ecosystem benefited from that. They, it really helped everyone First of all, to encourage keeping the jobs here and during the pandemic, making sure everyone was working. So buying locally as a business, it's an ecosystem that you support. It's really, it's, it's dans l'intérêt commun of everyone to do that. So absolutely, I believe in it. And from the pandemic perspective now, yeah. it's not even a question. It is a profitable and sustainable way of doing business. Is, is there a benefit for the climate, uh, for solving climate crisis, the fact that we've learned that lesson through the pandemic? Absolutely, absolutely. Right away, everything, the impact of uh, very little, the impact from transportation, the impact of making sure the people works, the impact of, it, it really has a big impact on the climate change. So obviously, if I understand your question correctly, but mm. yes, being local definitely has an impact. So I think when people talk about climate change a lot, there can be a lot of sort of doom and gloom and um, uh, negativity. And, and there's a lot of anxiety as well, uh, you know, among people who are, especially young people who are very concerned about what their future is going to look like and, and what their children's future is going to look like. But I think that 
from what I'm gathering from, from the three of you, it sounds to me like you have uh, reason to be excited and hopeful. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the opportunities uh, that have sort of presented themselves through this, these announcements that the governments are making about a green transition and stuff. Um, maybe, Julie, you could talk a little bit about your experience with Loop and, and sort of identifying an, an opportunity, a, a place where the market isn't really working properly. Um, and maybe you could give a little bit of advice to somebody who maybe wants to get involved but doesn't know where to start or maybe what they can offer. Yeah, sure. So I think during the, yeah, what we, what we realize is, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, what we realize is that there is so many opportunities everywhere with, uh, with all you can be involved. And I used to be super skeptical. I used to be really pessimistic. I didn't want to have any children because I didn't really see a future uh, because it, during the last five years, I was like, oh my God, there is so many things going on and there's, it's, it's so bad. And I was not really hopeful of a bright future for children. And just we just had the baby a couple of weeks ago because now I see that there is opportunities. And I think that when we're talking about is it the corporation or the individual, but it's really, it, it's all connected because I was talking about food waste, for example, as being a problem that comes from the industry. But at the same time, it's a lot in our hands and consumers, what we what we expect and what we want from the industry that creates that pressure. So it's all connected together. Uh, so for example, we have so many, we see so many things in the industry like, oh, the watermelon that was all green outside is being thrown away just because it's not, it doesn't have the stripes on it. Like, and it sells twice as many if you have the stripes on it, like little details like that, or just in terms of you expect in the grocery stores, when you go to the grocery store, you expect everything to be available all the time. But if something is not available, you're mad at the grocery store and you you put pressure on it and you say, oh, how come you don't have any peppers this week? You, you need to have peppers all the time. So I think as a consumers, we need to be more uh, be more understanding of uh, maybe of the industry and maybe sometimes not all the products are available. So this is really a first step is really sometimes to ask question and and even like if you look at the tomato that is a bit uh weirdly shaped or has uh, marks on it maybe it's just actually it's more healthy because it hasn't been uh sprayed with a lot of pesticides it's actually a perfect tomato is a suspect tomato it's we need to change our mentality so it, it's really the first step that we can take as a consumer is to always understand more and question more. And another thing that we see uh, as an industry is that there is a lot of misconception in terms of what is really greener than the other one. Uh, mm -hmm. Packaging is a super good example. Uh, we see the industry going in the wrong direction because consumers think it's more sustainable, this type of packaging compared to the other one. But in reality, uh, if you look at life cycle assessment and you go deeper in terms of environmental impact all along the chain, you realize that there is more impact to the packaging that everybody think is, that, that is greener. Uh, so this is also super difficult because it, push, it pushes the industry in the wrong direction. Uh, mm -hmm. Because industry, at the end of the day, what the industry creates in terms of products is really what consumers want. And if consumers put that pressure in, cons like we were talking about, but like, buying or voting with your dollar and it's it's really it really is uh because as, as soon as you see that this is what consumer wants like the big corporation are going to change and are going to go in that direction because they want to sell their product so if it's if it's what's being popular uh, they're going to make it but for that we need to ensure consumers are well educated enough uh so that they push the industry in the right direction because most of the time it, it's not the case of what we see right now Mm -hmm. I think that that's that message is, is coming across. And I think that business leaders like yourselves, but also sort of, um, you know, in the financial sector and stuff like that are also starting to see the writing on the wall. But Chris, maybe you could talk about this. You know, we've been seeing um, big investment companies like BlackRock just last year, biggest investment company in the world, basically saying, if you guys don't have an environmental sustainability plan in your in your business plan, we're not going to invest in you guys anymore. Um, I was watching a, a panel today. John Kerry was hosting with uh, leaders from banks in the U.S., Bank of America, Citigroup, who are you know committing to only investing in um, companies that are committed to going towards carbon neutral. And they were talking about a four a four point six trillion dollar private. 
uh, investment fund to fund uh, clean tech, clean energy, um, you know, types of different types of projects that are, are that are climate solutions. As someone who works in in an industry where you're you know you're trying to develop a new technology, Chris, how encouraging is it that now finally you're starting to see the, the financial backing? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because um, actually I'm not. This is not new for me. I've been in clean tech for 15 years, and I lived through the last clean tech crash, uh, which was disappointing. Uh, but we made it out alive. So we had a solar company, we started it, we uh, grew it up to 200 people, sold it, but not everybody lost it, right? Uh, there was a huge crash in 2010. And, uh, and it's, it's basically music to my ears, right? The, the, they've pulled the ripcord and they've, they've basically said, this is what's happening now. And like, it's no holds barred. So, so, and like people like an Exxon Mobil and all these companies, they're scared, right? They're, 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 they, they are scared and they're looking like, what are we going to do next? Right? Because it's like, it's like, it's like 1985 and who is going to inv invest in Philip J. Morris in cigarettes, right? It's the same thing. Nobody's going to invest in cigarettes. It's the same thing as oil today. So like that thing is dead. The new, the, the new system's alive and here we are, right? So it's only a question of time. It's inevitable that people change. It's inevitable right now. I think that's driven by you know consumers at the you know at the end of the day. And Annie, you you're someone who's building her, your business around this idea that consumers want uh, ethically sourced, uh, clean products. So can you tell me a little bit about sort of where consumers are uh, these days and, and, and how encouraging it is for you who wants to run a business like this, that people value what you're offering. Yeah, and it's, yeah. Much, yeah, it's much more encouraging today because 10 years ago when I started the business and I would say, do you want to buy some eco-friendly products? Well, no, and it doesn't work and it's too expensive. Second, it's unscented. Uh, but look, if it doesn't smell lavender, it's, it mm -hmm. doesn't work. And finally, I would ask them to, uh, to bring back their bottles because it can last uh, a thousand years in the environment. Today, I think two and a half years ago when Greta uh, walked in Montreal, for me, that's when I saw a shift. Mm -hmm. The consumers, first of all, have has been um, seeing on the news all everything from the Starbucks straws and like corporation making those little step, uh, the news, the for me, the plastic ocean, I could see the consumers going forward and asking about getting our products. Because before that, it was pushing, pushing my product. So now I finally, I had people come over and said, okay, we like your concept. Let's bring it on. And really the one in, in 2019, it's Canadian Tire that showed up on the doorstep and said, you know what, the fact that you're a woman-owned business, B Corp certified, locally sourced and uh, eco-friendly, we want to help you grow your business. So then you know, you know you've know, you got the, the year of the big corporation because the consumers are asking about you. They're asking about our type products, and uh, and I see it. It's 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 everywhere from the webs, the web to the retail right now. They're there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I thought it was striking. I, I found out recently that business schools at the MBA level are teaching sustainability practices in marketing classes. Oh, so okay. that is an interesting um, development, I think, and it also raises a question of greenwashing. How big of an issue do you guys think greenwashing is? Are you concerned, Julie, that um, perhaps there's uh, the corporations as they start to see that people want green products and they want their, you know, the companies that they buy from to be, to have a, you know, to be green and to have sustainability uh, as a value. Are you concerned that those companies might just market themselves that way and not actually do what they say they're doing. I think that was an issue when sustainability started, like ab about maybe five, 10 years ago, it was more an issue because companies started to, uh, just wanted to communicate about uh, about their sustainability initiatives. And sometimes it was not real or really, I think it's really an issue, but 
I see less and less because people now, like I think consumers do their homework really more now and they're super skeptical about any sustainable team message. They question a lot, they ask questions, they go, they see now with also social media and everything, if you get caught, it's so bad that now consume, companies are super, super scared of that. And it's funny that you talk about uh, mar mar sustainability class and marketing because I used to work as a sustainability marketing specialist uh, there was, uh, so my position as a sustainability specialist uh, when I was working before in food industry was really in the marketing department. Um, and it was always uh, it was always something really challenging because at the same time, I think it's super important. You need to be able to market your sustainability initiatives in a good way and in a way that you're going to bring back value to the company. Because if you're not able to show the value of what you're doing as a sustainability like a per person in a company, it's really difficult to have like the leadership team on board, for example. So the fact that you can market it well and you can communicate about it in a transparent way is really, really important. But at the same time, you need to, to be able to walk the talk. That's for sure. And, and I think consumers now are, are really skeptical. They're, they're more skeptical than they were before. Uh, and most of the time, first time they see, they read something sustainable, uh, they don't believe it. <laughs> and we, we see it sometimes and they try to find like what's wrong with the model. Mm -hmm. And then you need to, to have a lot of real concrete actions to be able to gain that trust and to have something, uh, yeah, to have that added value of your, your initiatives. Mm -hmm. The one that just sticks out in my mind is you see uh, advertisements after you know, the first intermission of the Habs game and it's shell, it's like committed to the green future. And you're like, that doesn't really make sense in my mind. Um, well, Chris, what's your reaction to, to seeing stuff like that? Do you think that perhaps people can say, oh, shell even is taking it seriously. Could it lead to complacency? Well, like basically, I mean, companies like shell are investing in uh, like uh, renewable, renewable energy and other things. And they're actually like, you know, they talk to companies like us as well, but the fact remains that they make all their profits from digging up or sucking out oil from the ground. And they know they have to change. They're dead, they're done. So it's just a question of time. And uh, the point being is that they have to um, get into something else. Previously, Shell has been like in 20 years, they've been, they, they've been looking at these things and they've never been successful. But now they've taken a new step forward and saying that we have to do this. So it, I would say that over the last year, there's been a, a pretty big change. Um, I mean, at least I've, I've convinced myself of that. So the, uh, I'm hoping I'm right. <laughs> but uh, I think we're on the right path. And Annie, maybe we can sort of circle back to this idea of the triple bottom line or, or well-being economy. I'm not sure if you follow that. You know, um, maybe if, if people don't know what the triple bottom line is, uh, maybe you could sort of explain what that is. Actually, it's the three Ps. It's like every decision from the purchasing um, to the selling the product and even the marketing is that you think about the product being so profitably because you need to ultimately make money, but you, at the same time, you need to think about the people and the planet. So for me, it's the three piece uh, bottom line, which uh, Julie is doing uh, perfectly also in Chris. But uh, for me, um, I think sustainability, yes, it's about the planet and today it's about Earth Day. So we talk more about that, but it's definitely also the community for me, making sure I have a policy of uh, investing in local supply ship in 20%. Uh, now I'm at 38% of women-owned businesses that I invest to. Um, so there's things that I'm doing uh, locally with my suppliers. For me, that's part of the people. It's part of the community. Um, making sure I reinvest in my very own local community is very important also. So anything about the charity and we've got a uh, volunteer, each employee has 20 hours. And we've decided to really focus like five kilometers from the office. So to truly have an impact where we work. Because I, I picked uh, Villemar because it was underprivileged environment. And there was a, a girl there that owns buildings is Nathalie Volant, who has uh, the B Corp certification. So I absolutely wanted to be in one of her building because uh, we, I, I knew the building would be run uh, better than other uh, 
So for me, that's it. So being that's part of the social and that's part of the people also. Do you think that is scalable to like the biggest companies in the world? Like, for example, a Shell, we don't have to pick on Shell very much longer, but, you know, are, is it scalable to for, for a big, massive multinational co corporation um, to, you know, remove profit as its sole motivator and to think about these other oh, things as well? No, no. I think there's a movement and the CEOs for, uh, that runs for purpose. It's a movement that's alive. We see I talk to big, large companies regularly they're looking at the b corp uh and and we do see some fail we saw uh danone ceo uh being laid off because uh but you know what he lost his job because of his beliefs it's gonna it's gonna move you know what it was one step back but i talked to the sodexo of the world they're very large company they know they have to do something is it scalable to their level, they'll be able to do it step by step. Uh, I'm a very small company, so it's easier, mind you, to do. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I do believe that there's ways. Um, the big companies, like Chris was saying, you know, you, you're skeptical. The big companies in my industry that are buying companies like me because they want to kind of buy themselves a good conscience. <laughs> but then again, uh, consumers don't really believe in that. They don't believe they're doing it for the right reason. They believe, like like you say, they they want to acquire a market share. But eventually, the consumers, as Julie was saying, the consumer pushes the large companies to act and 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 manage differently. Mm -hmm. I think they definitely that... need them on board. That's for sure because they just change a little thing, and it has such a huge impact. Huge impact. That, yeah, that we really need them on board. So it mm. needs to be. Yeah, need to apply to them too for sure. Yeah, there definitely needs to be like a push and pull. Like the yep. the consumers have to pull uh, pull the uh, from the marketing side, and the mm -hmm. uh, like large corporations have to push. So both of these things are happening right now. Yeah. Um, I, and and certification like B Corp that you, you have, and it's super interesting for these companies because, because it's so difficult for them to have the credibility of what yeah. they're doing is, is true, that a third party certification like that is really a way of showing that it's not greenwashing, it's something that's been approved by, by a third party and that mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, real. Um, we've been talking about a lot of good news uh, with the, the way that, you know, public opinion is changing and investors are, are starting to think differently. But this week, there was also some concerning news. Um, the World Meteorological uh, Organization part of the UN uh, put out its annual state of the climate report and uh, announced that the average global temperature has already reached 1.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Uh, of course, the Paris Climate agreement is an agreement uh, to try and keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, with that in mind, I think we should go around the table and talk about whether we think that um, governments, businesses are doing enough, whether our uh, timelines are perhaps too, too long. Julie? Yeah, I don't think we are doing enough, that's for sure, because it, it like it changes so quickly that we need to take uh, like drastic actions. But I I really believe that companies are part of that and that companies need to be on board. And so it's not like it, it's easy to push that in, in the in the government ends. But I think it's really companies that needs to be part of that movement also and to be part of the of the solution, definitely. Uh, and and when I hear things like that, I get <laughs> goosebumps because it's I think we are at that point that we really need to act and to act fast and to create businesses that has a net positive impact. And that was also the idea when we created Loop is that if you will look at the entire greenhouse gas emissions that we generate, because each, every business generates green, like has an impact and generate greenhouse gas. You don't, you don't really have a choice because you, you buy stuff, you have, you have a packaging and things like that. But we need to create more businesses that if you look at the entire impact, it has a net positive impact. And that was the idea. And that if you look at what we save in terms of fruits and vegetables, for example, and what we, we generate in terms of greenhouse gas, like the, the impact total is net positive. So, and that's, that's super important that we encourage companies uh, to be more in that direction too. And for that, it's not just about regulations and laws, but it's also to, to help financially businesses with models that, like that to really grow and develop. So, 
just financial help. And I think there is more and more help in, in that direction. Uh, we have a lot of grants just because of our commitment and because of the fact that we do food waste. So I think there is uh, definitely a, a, an help like that that is really necessary also for uh, companies like us to, yeah. to uh, start. Julie, do you think that there's enough information online easily accessible so that the average consumer could go and do that research about a company? Or do you think that there needs to be a better way for companies, perhaps forcing companies to disclose the full um, footprint of their product uh, the, from the beginning to when it's on the shelf? Do you, like, is, it, is it easy enough for, for the average consumer to find that information? No, it's super, super difficult. Most of, com of consumers won't know, and even most of companies don't even know like the impact that they generate with their products. But I've, I've started to see in some packaging, uh, not in Canada, but over the world, that you can see now on the packaging, it's not a certification, but it's really the, like, the amount of greenhouse gas that's being generated by this packaging. And, but it, it's kind of still something really up in the air that consumers won't really understand. If you say like 1.5 or 2 or it, what, what does it really mean? Uh, so I think if we have some standards and that we can compare one product to another and eventually rate the, the greenhouse gas emission on the product, that would be something super, super interesting. Uh, and that's something that could be mandatory. Like you, you, there could be a law that every product on the shelf, uh, that's a bit far-fetched, but that, that would be great. Every product on the shelf, you need to calculate and measure your global, like your impact on, on greenhouse gas impact overall. And then find a way to, to compare products together so consumers can take a better decision. But it's so hard for consumers to understand and to know what products is better in terms of environmental impact. It's almost impossible with the information we have. And most companies don't even disclose information like that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, not something publicly available. Chris, what do you think about you know the industry that you're in? Obviously the construction industry is pretty <laughs> set in its ways, uh, you can say. Um, but you know, you, what you were saying, there's an unbelievable amount of concrete that's still being used. Um, how do you break through? How do you, what kind of help do you need from governments, uh, regulatory help uh, to get some of these new innovative products into the, uh, into the industry? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think the, uh, the, I mean, we can talk about Canada uh, as an example. I think uh, the government of Canada has made a lot of uh, steps forward. Uh, we've got, um, uh, carbon pricing now that's uh, set at a certain price and rise, rising up to 150 bucks a ton by 2030, uh, which is a fantastic step, to be quite honest, because there, there's a price on pollution. Um, you, you know, like we don't just throw stuff out, right, and expect it to disappear. We live on an earth that doesn't, you can't make another earth. Um, and, and separately of that, this last budget is also putting some uh, focus on, um, you know, supporting companies and technologies like ours uh, to actually go out and do that because the, the, the hill to climb is, is really, is really high. I mean, for example, in the electricity industry, like people like uh, electricity plants that have been built decades ago. And so all the costs are sunk, right? So to come up with a new electricity program or a way to make electricity costs a lot of money, same thing. To replace concrete, the there's a whole bunch of investment that has to be done. So there needs to be support, right? And it, it's happening. But, you know, the government still supports fossil fuels, right? They, like there's almost a hundred billion dollars a year put into fossil fuel subsidies around the world. Can you believe that? So we're still paying, like through taxes, not us specifically, but like around the world for the, this stuff. Quebec, Quebec put $400 million into a new cement plant in Gas Bay, which makes a million tons of CO2. And here they are asking us, how can we help you? And they've already given like $40 million to a company that makes a million tons of CO2. Like there's no sense to this, right? So I think that all that stuff's gonna stop. That's that's for sure. There's, that, that is, there's gonna be a screeching halt to those types of subsidies very shortly, I would say. That's the easiest and best way. Do you buy the arguments uh, from politicians that you often hear, oh, it's a transition. We need to continue to invest in oil and gas and in cement and, and stuff while we transition. We got to buy a pipeline. We got to do these things so that we can maintain 
um, you know, our energy sector while we transition. Do you buy that or do you need or do you think it needs to be a more sudden transition? I'm not Naomi Klein and I'm also not, uh, you know, Jason Kenny. So the um, <laughs> I'm somewhere in between. Fair enough. Yeah, the, 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 um, <laughs> I'm not sure I answer that question. The, uh, the uh, no. <laughs> That's my answer. Probably we should not be uh, supporting pipelines, but uh, politicians need to get reelected, and that's the uh, that's the big uh, that's the big issue about being a politician. So mm -hmm. I can't I, I can't answer that as a, as a non politician. Fair enough, Annie. How important are are laws like this um, uh, single use plastic ban that the federal government's been talking about that we've been talking about it at the city level for? years, um, how important are, are, are laws like that? Oh, they're definitely important. I think the more the consumer is gonna ask for it, companies like us, uh, like ours, will do the initiatives and government must do some regulation. As soon as the government implemented it at the SAQ for the bag, we immediately saw suddenly a change of consumer's habit in less than three years. So I think that's when, that's when they stepped in with one of their uh, subdivisions, uh, how do you call that? Like a, a company uh, gouvernementale, that as soon as they decide to do it, then that we saw a major change in the consumer's habit. So yes, they're important. My new, in my industry, we need to even to start further down because the labeling act, you don't have to disclose any ingredients of cleaning products. So we're far, far behind. We need to start by doing that and definitely uh, make more rules. Do you think it should be like food where you have to disclose Absolutely. the I'm, I'm, food? And yes, I'm definitely working on that on the yeah. government level. Definitely. We need to do that. That's super interesting. I mean, it's sort of what we were talking about, Julia, before about, um, um, you know, if you could put on the label the, the entire carbon footprint as well. So maybe there's That's a model a great there. idea, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I will add a, add, a, add a little something about that because on the fact that I think sometimes like uh, it's also politicians want to be reelected so they pass laws like that but they also have to there is some things that are not considered overall though so for example if you look at plastic it's it's and because this food food waste is such my my big concern if you look at for example you know the cucumber just a little plastic wrap because now the what is trendy is that you need your fruit and vegetables to be naked but that packaging really has an impact and really has a, a function that needs to be considered. So if you put that little plastic wrap around your cucumber, it will last 12 days longer. And overall, you will save so much food and you will lose, you actually reduce food waste in such a huge quantity that the impact of putting the plastics is less it's important less. The, of the food waste. Yeah, it's less than what the food waste would be. So yes, we'd say so it's sometimes it's important to also consider things like that and to take the entire like, life cycle assessment impact and to consider it in the big picture because it's easy to say oh plastic is bad so let's ban all like single use plastic but at the same time some of them is super necessary to ensure there is less food waste for example so we really need to take a lot of things into consideration and sometimes it's i think it's not like they, they didn't dig enough uh to to pass the regulations like that to have like a really positive impact as it should have I guess for an issue as big as this, there's going to really need to be targeted um, policies, mm -hmm. not just sort of a blanket, no plastic mm -hmm. or a blanket, no fossil fuels. Um, you know, it's really going to have to be um, well thought out and, and targeted. I think um, we're getting close to the end. So I'm just going to sort of ask one more question um, for of each of you. And Chris, maybe you could start. How confident are you that uh, we as a species are going to be able to pull this thing off? Well, I'm committed and I've been committed for 15 years. So I have no issue with putting my hand down and saying, we're, we're going to do this. It, it's inevitable. Why, why do you think it's inevitable? Um, well, it's, I mean, like imagine that there, there was this worldwide pandemic and like we all got sick and literally everybody was affected by it. And imagine they came up with a vaccine in seven months when it takes like 10 years. Wouldn't that be crazy? 
yeah. I take your point. I take your point. <laughs> Annie, what do you think? How, how confident are you that, um, you know, that we'll be able to solve this? I'm comfortable because I'm, I'm optimistic person. So uh, I want to believe that, uh, that uh, we are going to race to the challenge. Uh, I know so. Um, what I'm optimistic about is seeing today, I felt for the first time really a sense of urgency. And I, I didn't feel that the years before, but this year all day long, uh, I had panels and I, I, I had conferences and I had a different feeling. I think people now are really saying, okay, it's not minuit moins cinq, it's really 15 after and that we must race to the challenge. So um, what I'm hearing, it's say, I, I don't mind the statistic that you tell us about the degree of the water because it just, gives us more one more reason to move forward and speed to the market go quicker see and julie what about you last word yeah i'm i'm more and more confident and, and super optimistic as i just mentioned is that we just got a baby because now i i see that there is there is hope actually and i see so many many companies starting all around us and i see companies like the one that annie and chris started that are just there is more people around there that want to make a difference. And there is, yeah, there is really a movement. I see a huge movement right now of companies really started to take action and consumers like individuals, everybody uh, started to be more uh, conscious about their impact. And even people that I had like 10 years ago when I started in sustainability, everybody around me were super like, oh, but what, what, what is it really or really? nobody really knew about the environment at that time and now everybody knew and everybody know and everybody wants to to have to take part and to to yeah be part of that movement so i'm really optimistic now i've really changed my mind about that in the last uh, year and a half i will say <laughs> well great and congratulations on your uh, new baby i have one that's turning awesome. one tomorrow so or saturday i should say um so uh i i felt the same way as you did for a long time about about uh, having a kid and then to have a kid, it's really sort of um, motivated me to become more active and, and tell more stories uh, about the climate and do things like this. So, yeah, so just one more word. Uh, that's pretty much why I'm doing all of this because I have kids and, um, you know, climate change is gonna affect me somehow, uh, but it's gonna affect my kids way more, like way more, like in fact, like it could be, if we don't do anything, it's going to be what they're going to deal with. Imagine like a nonstop pandemic. Just imagine that. Like, like how tired are we right now? We're tired. Aren't Very. We? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so there's no vaccine for climate change. There isn't. So yeah. the, the, the question is, is we all have to figure it out. Yeah, I think that's a good place to, to finish the discussion. I know that um, some people have been sending in some questions, so we can move to a QA and a um, now if you'd like. But I just want to say thanks, guys, to the three of you for, for taking the time to do this and uh, sharing your expertise. And it's been a very enlightening conversation, I think, and encouraging. So again, thanks very much. And uh, I'm sure everybody is giving a virtual round of applause. <laughs> And uh, I'll maybe l let Melissa jump back in and uh, we can start with the Q&A. Thank you so much, everyone. This has been very interesting and very eye-opening in many ways. We've received a few questions from the public, so I'm going to ask them to you. Um, Andrew would like to know, what is the best way to inspire young people to affect positive environmental change through entrepreneurship? I don't know who wants to start, maybe Judy, if you'd like. Uh, that's a good question. I feel like there is already, uh, there is kind of already that movement that it's really, I'm super impressed by how you people are super involved already. I see a lot of them that wants to start companies and it's always, it always starts by a problem that they want to solve. Uh, so it, it's hard to say how we can inspire them more. I think it's just by sharing a lot of good stories, a lot of uh, success stories of companies who have uh, succeeded in that way. And to talk a lot about how it's, how it's easier to start a business, because right now I really believe that it's easier to start a business that has values and that solve a real problem 
Uh, be, and that's the way it's going to be more and more. If you just build a business out of an opportunity, you probably, or just, just a money opportunity, you probably won't last that long because now you really need, for companies to be successful in the future, I think you really need to solve a problem. Uh, and that's the way people will talk about you. You'll have to invest less in marketing. You will have more success, more media coverage, more people wanted to uh, talk about you, help you out. Uh, so I think it's just to share about these success that will inspire them to go in that direction because it's, it's really the future, honestly. I would, I would totally echo that, those comments. It's basically, you, have to, you, you, can't, you can't be chasing money. It has to be for a reason, right? Like you're trying to solve an issue and, and, and just get people to buy into it because, and then everything else will follow. Like, honestly, that, that's, that's what's going to happen. And it's, and I can finish that it's possible to build nice business, sustainable business that are profitable and that you don't have to compromise your values to build businesses today. So I think go. Thank you very much. Um, next question is from Dennis, who would like to know what is your biggest challenge in your business, respectively? I can start, uh, maybe, yeah, <laughs> maybe ahead, for me, for me, uh, the challenge, the biggest challenge was uh, financing the business. So I think uh, since the beginning, um, that was something that I had to uh, seeing a bank and telling him about, yes, the product, but talking also about all my initiatives other than the product and the profit, it just, they didn't understand. So that, that for me was a big uh, a big challenge, but more and more, like Matt was saying, and Chris, um, we've got investments and investors that do want now to make investment in uh, greener companies. Thank you. Um, do you want to add anything else, Julie, Chris? Uh, I can. Okay, I can share about our biggest challenge us is just to kind of slow down because <laughs> we are so driven by that mission that we have a lot of opportunities of people calling us with product or food that they throw away and every time we're like okay we need to focus because we have so many things at the same time and we're a small team uh, so it, it's really the lack of time being a startup having to wear so many ads uh, that's really challenging just to try to slow down because every time somebody calls us with food that it will we want to do something and uh it's really to focus and to be able to implement that like not just rush into things uh because we we need operations to follow we need human resources to follow and that's our challenge right now is that we always have these ideas and we're like okay let's go we are launching a new line of this type of product and then it's just it's a bit chaotic because <laughs> uh yeah maybe it just it's so quickly but we we were so driven by that mission that's our biggest challenge definitely yeah, our biggest challenge is convincing people to change the way they make concrete, which has been made the same way for 2,500 years. So that's a big, bit of a challenge. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Dennis would also like to know who is the biggest influence in your life? A role model, if you, if you wish. <laughs> That's easy. That that's my uh, my husband, <laughs> uh, who is also the co-founder of Loop and uh, who is also the co-founder of Rice Kombucha and Cru d'Essence. Uh, because before starting Loop, I was um, his name is David Cote, and uh, before starting Loop, I always dreamt of being an entrepreneur and starting my own project. But I was super scared. I didn't really, uh, yeah, I was I was scared of the risk of starting a business. I was scared at the same time that it I didn't have what you need to be an entrepreneur. I was like, oh, maybe I'm too young. Maybe I don't have enough experience. I didn't study in, in, in entrepreneurship or things like that. And he, he really inspired me because he started this business from his apartment, uh, delivering like his lunch boxes with a, with, a vil with a bicycle and just doing that without really having studied in anything in particular and just uh, he traveled during eight years and that's how he decided to start a business. And, for me, that was super inspiring to see that you can you can come from not a, not a background in that area and to be able to build these successful uh, businesses and he, he inspired me a lot in that in that way. Thank you. 
And I can add that David also inspired me because he was the first one buying the unscented company for rice and uh, for Cru de Sens. And he put it, and David really believes in all local businesses. And I think in Quebec and in Montreal, we have such great entrepreneurs that different um, industries that we all know each other, we talk to each other, and and mainly, mainly uh, David really believes in the local businesses, and uh, he was um, he was very uh, very uh, helpful to me right at the beginning. Interesting. I, I was at McGill around the same time as Julian. Uh, I didn't realize oh, okay. that uh, that uh, Rise was um, mm -hmm. David associated. Also, with that. Yeah. Um, anyways, um, my family, that's the, the, um, basically the motivation here. Thank you. Um, we'll go with another question. What can municipalities do to be more sustainable? Let's say top one or two actions that municipalities. But it demands that you have to have low carbon products. Dot com. <laughs> there you go. There's nothing else you have to do. All right, thank you. I will end with, uh, we had a comment from the- I have an idea. Oh, sorry, go, go ahead. <laughs> I, I, no, I was just maybe educate more about uh, the, the recyclability, because I, I realized that a lot of people don't know what's, be, what's recyclable, what's not, and the way to recycle in a way that your products are gonna be like, really recycled at the sorting facility, because most of the time, just the way you put it in the bin, uh, is as an impact and it, it, it's, the, it's what makes the, the decision of it's, it's going to be recycled or not. Uh, so I think yeah, a lot of people lack information about that and it could be interesting to have some workshop in the municipality to educate the people around that. Yeah, that I agree. That's good. Um, Dennis, who asked questions before, is saying thank you for all your answers and then hashtag buy local. And we all agree for, with that. I would like to end. Um, the mayor of Westmount made a comment and I would like to share it with you guys. She said, thank you for taking the time to share your experiences and to motivate us to work to rise to the challenge. And I would like to extend that. And thank you so much for partaking in this initiative for Earth Day, our first online virtual Earth Day for, this, for the city. So uh, thank you, Matt, for your questions. And that was a great discussion. And uh, thank you so much.